What's going on? I'm Larry Hoover Jr. and I'm rocking with Street Certified News. Yo, it's your boy L. Hitter, Mr. All Yeah, y'all already know what it is, man. I'm rocking with Street Certified News. We got behind the scenes, man. We're gonna tie this bitch up. What up, it's your boy Bum J. We rocking with Street Certified News. It's that great. For the last few months, there's been a trend on YouTube that honestly, we have to admit we've been a huge part of. YouTube is full of rats. Videos about rats, interviews with rats, debates about who's a rat and who's not a rat. At this point, it's the biggest topic in hip hop news and the youth is listening. All of this rat talk eventually led us down a rabbit hole as deep as American history itself. And the entire time, the same questions burned. Why are snitches today becoming so popular and even more accepted? Who does this benefit? And why after hundreds of years of American history now? Now before you jump to the conclusion of society, safer streets, utopian future, blah, blah, blah. Consider the reality of everyone telling on everybody for everything. What if this is exactly what those in leadership want? For the population to only have loyalty to them. What if the federal government's biggest enemy was its own people? What if the government's biggest threat to their power was the working class removing themselves from the corporate conveyor belt and striking out in the streets on their own, creating their own communities, businesses, organizations, and laws? The history of the organization of criminals speaks first of silence and anonymity. Originally, those who took part in organized crime in America did so as outlaws in barren outposts or as immigrants in a country to which they did not speak the same language. Thus, crimes in both instances were largely going unnoticed by those outside of the communities themselves. Largely over time, these ethnic organizations transitioned from robbery, extortion, forgery, and bootlegging into real estate, banking, labor unions, and high-end consumer goods. Decades later, now representing interests in some of America's largest corporations. Those were the success stories, however. Those were the stories never told. In their place, the public told stories of those who reached the top and yet never quite made it out. In early American folklore, men like Buffalo Bill, Billy the Kid, and even as far back as Paul Revere were made famous for going against the system, having guns, and their disdain for law enforcement. Modern day militia men gangbangers. Fast forward to the early 1900s, Stories of Al Capone, John Dillinger, and Bonnie and Clyde weren't just goals for the hardened criminal. These figures were celebrated by all of society for their attitude towards police. It is safe to say that, up until very recent times, the general consensus of all humans on Earth was fuck 12. In 1935, in response to this attitude, the version of the FBI we now know today was born, founded by documented racist J. Edgar Hoover, when a law enforcement agency of the federal government dating back to 1908 was renamed, the FBI would in future decades levy its attention towards a second generation of ethnic groups still within those inner cities of America. In its infancy, the FBI focused mainly on taking down European criminal ethnic groups. After years of second generation kids of those immigrants joined the FBI, 
The government had plenty of undercover operatives to fill the ranks of the top criminal organizations, effectively removing their veil of secrecy from within. Simultaneously, J. Edgar Hoover, having very few African American officers, needed a different strategy to destabilize growing black organizations he feared may have intentions to topple the United States government in the future. Did we mention he was a racist? Yes, he did use some black agents as informants from inside black organizations. But more importantly, from 1956 through 1971, COINTEL PRO was a covert FBI operation overseen by J. Edgar Hoover himself, created to discredit reputable sources, misinform the black community, and smear the reputations of black leaders and others who supported their ideas. For some reason, people in the government had this idea that black people in America were angry and with the right leader may seek independence from or violence towards the United States. When smear tactics didn't work, some accused FBI agents of bringing drugs into organizations like the Black Panthers to criminalize their members and of outright murdering notable civil rights figures who would not allow it. In years since, and under pressure from the black community and government whistleblowers, official congressional committees have concluded that COINTELPRO did exist illegally and exceeded statutory limits and violated constitutional guarantees of free speech. Coincidentally, although the United States government has admitted in the past to some wrongdoings, there has always been a culture of not telling or not snitching to the public about things not yet exposed. In the 1980s, the United States government looking to fund their fight against communism in the Western Hemisphere bought hundreds of kilos of cocaine from Central American freedom fighters. These fighters were growing and distributing these drugs to fund their wars in their homeland. In the United States, wanting to help out, happily bought them, then flooded American streets with the drugs to recoup the cost. This influx of thousands of kilos of cocaine was strategically focused on the black and Latin communities in America's largest cities, effectively killing two national security birds with one stone. At the same time, the Hollywood movie Scarface featuring Al Pacino was top of the box office. In the movie, a Cuban immigrant becomes the biggest drug dealer in Miami. The rags to riches story, although ending in a bloody shootout, was one of the first to glamorize this new drug dealing lifestyle to millions of inner city kids. Before 1990, we really don't have to debate the ideas of the United States government, specifically the FBI towards black organizations. It is a fact that the FBI was founded by a racist and had covert operations exposed decades later aimed at destabilizing black communities and their leadership. Those are facts and they cannot be debated. We can also not debate why and how the United States government started the drug epidemic in the 1980s. Now having been caught twice, actively destabilizing the black community with COINTELPRO in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and the Iran-Contra crack epidemic in the 1980s, we can debate human nature. Human nature would say that having been caught twice already, the United States government could go one of two routes. Either the FBI would stop targeting urban ethnic people cold turkey and never enact racist policies and procedures again, or they would continue operations, this time in the most covert way possible. Soon after that cocaine epidemic of the 1980s, and now with the rise of drug addicts, drug dealers, and rap music in the black community, in the 1990s, the federal government, with the support of top officials, began doing business as private corrections corporations. Prisons that operated not under the leadership of civic government and ethics, but as capitalist entities. These entities would go on to then sell stakes in their companies to cash flow rich businesses. These entities would in turn take those funds 
and funnel the money to judges, lawmakers, and local police to help fill these new for-profit jails. Some of these new business investors also happen to be by total coincidence in the entertainment industry. And for these companies, profit could be seen on both sides. Incentivized to promote artists with criminal messages, these conglomerates who truly own the record labels were now profiting when the civilian population consumed the art and when impressionable youth reenacted their programming and ended up in prison. Throughout all of this time, and all of this effort by the government to create chaos and maintain control of the working public, sentiment towards law enforcement and leaders of the system overall had mainly remained low. Despite 80 plus years of service, not one of their famed agents would ever become as famous as the men they were chasing. Gangsters were front page news, while cops were left giving awards to themselves. In recent years, however, and with the age of social media, the ability to misinform communities has become even more effective. For decades, federal agents have employed snitches and informants on their payroll to provide information on the inner workings of organizations unable to be penetrated by conventional police tactics. These snitches operated in extremely dangerous conditions and were sometimes left without protection to be killed later even after providing the information to the police. But these days, social media has made the job of a snitch much easier. Many of them can now flex proceeds of telling on social media and be protected due to their money and public image. All while those in power are happily selling the new COINTELPRO. The generation of working from home, internet dating, and Amazon Prime is by design. You don't have any friends anymore. You are sad and everyone's a rat. You don't have to rely on others. Black boys can be criminals. And if you get caught, hey, these guys snitched and we gave them some money and nothing happened to them. Matter of fact, they got fame and more money afterwards. It's okay. The streets aren't real anyway.